Hey guys, it's Quickie Baby, and welcome back to World of Tanks. And today I'm previewing an upcoming tier 6 premium Soviet medium tank in the form of the M4A2, driven by a hero of the Soviet Union, Dmitry Lazar. And this video is going to let you know if it's just another run of the mill Sherman, and we've already got umpteen million of them at tier 6, or whether the fabled Soviet bias in World of Tanks is going to stretch to the first Soviet Sherman. Firstly, I'm going to run down the full statistics of this tank, compare it to the other Shermans in the game, and then I'm going to follow it up with some Ace Tanker gameplay. So let's see how it holds up. So here's Lazar's Sherman compared to the M4A3E2, the Fury, the EZ8, and also to Creighton Abrams Thunder. Thunderbolt. And immediately we notice that Lazar's Sherman is just the same as the Fury and the EZ-8, and also the E2 if you choose to use the 76mm on that tank. But it just outdoes the Thunderbolt a little bit with regards to DPM. Couple of things I'd like to highlight if you don't know anything about the Shermans. Horrible penetration for a tier 6 medium tank, 128mm with its standard shells, and 177 with its premium shells. Absolutely awful. And with 115 alpha damage, you're going to be out-traded by most tanks, and if you do dab that two key you're paying 2800 credits per shot to do 115 damage and still have fairly lackluster premium penetration for a tier 6 medium now onto the gun handling 2.3 seconds aim time while well, it's the same as the fear in the easy 8 but one thing that does suck is this vehicle gets 10 degrees of gun depression compared to the easy 8's 12 and its aim time and its accuracy is just a little bit worse than the thunderbolt and the turret traverse dispersion is also worse than the thunderbolt one thing that is very nice about the shermans however is that you can equip vertical stabilizers on these vehicles which will reduce your dispersion by 20% and it's one of the specialities of the tier 6 American medium tanks. Next up, mobility, and this is where Lazar Sherman kind of has a little bit of an advantage. 51.4 kilometers an hour forwards, faster than all of the other Shermans, nearly 10 kilometers faster than the Thunderbolt and the Fury, and massively better than the E2. However, this is all but negated by the fact that the engine power on this vehicle is the lowest, 410 horsepower, and its ground resistances are the same as the Fury and the Thunderbolt, which in turn means that the vehicle's abysmal 12.02 power to weight ratio leaves it flagging behind even the Thunderbolt, which was already the slowest of the Shermans. And unfortunately for the tank, this isn't something that's made up for by its armor. Lazar's Sherman has a standard 63.5mm at the front, the same as the EZ-8, and this is way worse than the Thunderbolt, which has that 123mm front plate and also some spacing down the side of the turret or down the hull. And of course, this vehicle doesn't have the luxury of having that 101mm of frontal hull armor that the M4A3E2 has, and of course, you can equip the stock turret on that tank can have 152 millimeters of turret armor, but of course, you lose a lot of the other strengths of the vehicle if you want to do that. And the armor on this vehicle, just like the EZ-8, is thoroughly mediocre. Even if you're using your 10 degrees of gun depression of this vehicle, it's hard to even bounce the mediocre penetration this tank has. The only real strength that you have is your mantlet that ranges from about 178 millimeters thick up to 242. That's really your only chance of ricocheting off the front of this vehicle, even in the best possible scenarios. But of course, the Soviet Sherman can't go hull down in as many locations as the EZ-8 can. And when you consider that the statistics of this vehicle are practically identical, apart from the EZ-8 having more gun depression, a better power to weight ratio, which actually allows it to get up to that 48 kilometers an hour way more often than Lazar's 51 kilometers an hour, it really does flag behind a little bit. One tiny advantage this tank has, however, is that while its radio range is worse than all of the other vehicles, it's got less chance to be set on fire, I guess, because it's a Soviet tank. So crew training wise, we can see this is indeed a Soviet vehicle, and you do get a special crew member in the form of Dmitry Lazar. And one thing that's interesting about him is that he doesn't come with brothers in arms for free, but he does come with six cents for free. And so that's kind of practically the same thing. You're going to be able to train brothers in arms faster, but already have six cents as its first skill. So that's rather useful. However, all of his other crew members in the tank with him do not come with any special skills whatsoever. As we can see here, if I reset for gold, no brothers in arms here, but if I reset Dmitry himself for gold, then you'll see that you start with six senses standard. And the next skill you train will be acting as if you didn't have sixth sense with regards to experience requirements. And so that's kind of a little bit disappointing when you think about it. Something like a Rudy or an ISU-122S, they come with a full crew of brothers in arms for free. This vehicle, however, only Dimitri will have anything special, but he is a unique crew member with regards to his personal data because you cannot change it unlike the other crew members in the tank. But of course, you can move him into whatever vehicle that you want. So for example, say I want to put him as the commander for my Object 140, 
then that's no problem, and then I can still put him in whatever premium vehicles that I feel, like putting a hero of the Soviet Union in. But I think that's quite enough theory crafting, let's see how the M4A2 performs on the battlefield. So the battle has begun indeed, we're rolling out on Muravanka in a standard matchup here, all tier 6 opponents, so we're going to see how this vehicle holds up against equal tiers. Although I would like to stress that this tank is exceptionally poor against tier 7 and tier 8 tanks, with 177mm of premium penetration and 128 on your standard rounds, how do you think that's going to do against tier 7 tanks, let alone tier 8 tanks? Not very well. However, one thing I'd like to highlight is, look, 45 kilometers an hour, not quite up. Okay, now we're at the advantage. With the EZ8 limited to 48, this vehicle has only got a 3 kilometer an hour advantage. And you'll see that as we start to go up the slope here, we're going to dip way below that. Now, while the penetration on this gun is bad, the DPM is actually pretty good. And so when you do get a 59-16 just pull out in front of you like this, the gun handling is rather nice with the vertical stabilizers. And while you probably have to sacrifice using vents on the tanks to be able to gain that little bit of a, a gun handling advantage, it's rather nice. And we shut down the 59-16 right at the start of this battle. However, right where we don't want to be with like 60 millimeters of armor, and there's in front of two auto-loading Czechoslovakian medium tanks, one spamming me full of APCR and the other just using standard standard rounds, and standard rounds more than sufficient to go through this vehicle frontally. Decides, is he going to come keep chasing me? I want to punish him if he does. Looks like he missed one. I put one into the side there to try and track him in place. Doesn't actually have more than one round. Wow, what a terrible play there by the Skoda. What a greedy play. Maybe a bit overconfident. Maybe didn't expect to miss a couple of shells into the ridge line there. And we're very happy to pick up our second kill of the game. Now I want to be aggressive. I want to get around this corner. Use my 10 degrees of gun depression and my good DPM to go hold down against these tanks. And this is where 10 degrees of gun depression and fairly decent mantlet armor can be very handy. And with no weak point on top of the tank, unlike this VK3002M, we can hopefully shoot into its cupola. However, we bounce one off the mantlet there. Finally one up into the top of the tank. And I don't think that he's going to be able to shoot me. So I put one into his lower plate there to finish him off. We missed the EZ-8. Can we get the SU-100? Not quite enough with 10 degrees. I think if I was using the EZ-8 there, I would have been able to depress the gun enough to get that SU-100. Um, first shot in, second one not quite in. At T-3485, I didn't realize he was quite on the left of my tank there, but I was grinding into him, didn't mean to do that. If I'd had that 12 degrees of gun depression, we wouldn't have had to. We had to try and readjust to get ourselves into the scenario that we could. Okay, so let's go to T25. Wow, one over the ridge line. Can we loop another one? Oh, look at that beautiful shot right into the top of his tank. And we're going to have to put all of them in if we want to be able to do anything in this vehicle, right? Up to 1,500 damage. I mean, if, if you do play aggressively in this vehicle and you work a ridge line and you get to shoot at tanks that you can penetrate, it's not too bad. And the gun handling on the vehicle, well, it's all right. But remember, this is everything that you could be doing in the EZ-8. And this is, I guess, it's not a favorable matchup. I guess this is the average matchup, but I don't know. I think that's stretching it. Ladies and gentlemen, you know just how bad the, the matchmaking system is currently with the template scheme in World of Tanks. The amount of times that you're actually playing against Tier 8 it far outweighs the amount of time that you're playing against Tier 6s, Tier 5s, or Tier 4s, and it's absolutely brutal. When this tank has to play against Tier 7s and Tier 8s, it's just demoralizing. It's demoralizing for me. I can only imagine how demoralizing it would be for all of you. Oh gosh, this T-3485, what's he planning? He just wants to reverse into me as much as possible. And I realized, well, if he's just going to drive behind me and try and get me shot here, then I had to pull back until he was no longer spotted. Hopefully we can put a round into the EZ-8. We'll have to wait and see in the post-game stats if we did hit that shot. Still trying to work that ridge line. And when you're down to this amount of hit points, and you can no longer kind of be aggressive because the Skoda T-25 will be able to get me. It does feel a little bit frustrating to not have any armor. If I was in one of the other Shermans, maybe something like a Thunderbolt, in this kind of a matchup, I would be looking to push the pace on the opponents and really take it to them. And when you've got that hull armor in the Thunderbolt, you feel you feel like you can do it. And you, the Thunderbolt isn't even that bad at side scraping because that front plate is so decent. But when I'm playing in Laza's M4A2 and it's to all intents and purposes a, a slower EZ8, although I understand its top speed limit is a slight bit higher, the, the power to weight ratio really holds the vehicle back. You just don't really have that confidence even in your awesome matchmaking like this. Come on, surely we're going to hit something now. Oh no, come on, die, Armel, die. No, oh, not quite yet. The T21 puts a shot into him. Will we hit the Skoda T25? Well, not quite yet. Well, there's a T21 left on the enemy team. Surely we can find him. There he is. Unable to depress the gun. We crit the T21. Don't actually damage him. Need to swing the tank around a little bit. There you go, into the turret. 
Can't kill me now, even a ricochet off the mantlet there and we shut down our fourth kill of the game. Not too shabby. Now we're joining the battle midway on Prokhorovka and as normal, one team's going to be deciding to go and sit up on the hill there and we're going to be just sniping across. And you'll see how good the M4A2 is at sniping. At 0.4 accuracy, it's not particularly wonderful. And while the tank does have an exceptional rate of fire, considering it has, well, awful alpha damage at 115, it, it can actually fully aim between its shots. But I stress that this is with an excellent crew. This is using a premium consumable. This is using vertical stabilizers, which do help with the dispersion a little bit, but obviously not with the aiming time. It's not a gun lane drive. But if you do aim your shots in, you can snipe effectively at long range. But again, a good crew. Brothers in arms on this. Um, we're also packing some a premium consumable. We're using snapshot. All of those things to just add that little bit of an advantage. But even without them, I think you can snipe fairly okay with this vehicle. However, it's, it's once again a case of needing to be in a good matchup to, to be able to penetrate all of the shots. Having dealt with all the tanks up on the on the hill there, we pick up a couple of kills. I want to turn my attention to this French light tank. Wow, one through the lower tracks there also sets him on fire. And we're going to be aggressive towards the Panzer 3-4. We shoot him on the move. We lock his tracks down. Now we're going to just make micro movements while moving forwards. We do get penetrated by the 3-4 there. A little bit disappointed with that. Nevertheless, you can assault very well in this vehicle. I mean, maybe it's because I do like tanks like the Comet, and so this kind of playstyle with the kind of shoot and scoot, but also still maintaining the micro movements between the shots and knowing just how long you have to move to still maintain your full accuracy, maybe that's something that uh, I have kind of mastered a little bit. But I'm sure that with practice you can still do very, very well in a tank like this. Oh, are we going to die? No, we don't. We actually survive in the M. 44 misses us and I'm very happy about that because it means that I'm going to be able to shot him down. Now I stop here because I'm actually using this rock to avoid shots from the Achilles while I shoot the M44. And I take a look to my left now, that rock saved my bacon so to say, now we're going to be moving over towards the Achilles. And you'll see that this tank, it doesn't have bad DPM, does it? Just like an easy 8 if you do get opponents to sit out in front of you, the 2100 will be dealing with them very quickly. Especially in a matchup like this, some tier 5s on the enemy team. They've got way fewer hit points than all of the higher tier vehicles. It starts to kind of like hit an exponential curve, doesn't it? Which kind of levels out, I think, about the tier 7 mark. The step up from tier 7 to tier 8 is not exactly dramatic, especially for, for tank destroyers, right? But then... I still think that from 5 to 6 is a real big step up, and 6 to 7, that's a big step up as well, especially with medium tanks. It feels like the, the, each step up in tier at 5 to 7 is absolutely dramatic. Nevertheless, what, what I'm trying to say is that basically 2,100 DPM in a matchup like this, when all of your opponents have mediocre hit points, just feels significant. Unfortunately, we don't pick up our top gun there. Five kills, 1,600 damage that we saw on Prokhorovka, and hopefully this gave you a little bit more of an idea of the gun handling that you will have on the M4A2. But once again, I'd like to stress that I've shown you two nice matchups here for the tank. I, I don't need to show you gameplay to see how frustrating it is to just be bouncing shell after shell after shell on tier 7 and tier 8 opponents, or dabbing the 2 key and starting to waste one of the whole points of playing a premium tank, which is to make credits. But I guess on the other hand, if you're looking for, at this as a crew trainer and you don't mind liberally applying those premium rounds, maybe you've got a premium account as well, then maybe you could farm up. So here's our first round on Muravank, an ace tanker for 2,300 experience. That's 1,179 base, and we actually got quite a big bonus for being a premium tank there. 531 out of 1,769. This be a fairly good crew trainer because we didn't have to fire any premium rounds here. We make 31,000 credits profit with a non-premium account and 50,000 credits profit profit with a premium account and we did miss a few shots here well we only hit 21 out of 36 but I feel like this is the kind of tank that needs to keep moving forwards and backwards just to evade the fire of your opponents because you don't have any kind of armor to be able to absorb the punishment and with a rate of fire as it has I think you just got to keep on shooting and eventually some of them are going to stick right next up on Prokhorovka this was a first class medal for 1048 base experience points five kills 1752 damage didn't fire any premium rounds so pretty much the same story just under 30,000 credits profit without a premium account and 45,000 with a premium account. 
One thing I would like to stress is that you will not be achieving these numbers in bad matchups. Don't even begin to fool yourself and one thing that's very frustrating as well is that this, these were fairly good damage games for a tier 6 medium tank, right? And we don't make a huge amount of credits. So if you're looking to make tons and tons and tons of credits, you're still best to buy a tier 7 or a tier 8 premium tank but I guess this could still stand as a crew trainer. So Laza Sherman is an absolutely incredible overpowered premium tank that is going to be starting to destroy the matchmaker. Well, no, that's certainly not the case. In fact, I would say this is worse than an easy ape. Sure, it's got a little bit better top speed limit. It's got a tiny less chance to be set on fire, but losing the gun depression and the power to weight ratio is absolutely horrific. And I think that this vehicle is way worse personally than a Thunderbolt, because if you do manage to get a Thunderbolt into a matchup like this, the frontal armor feels amazing. Amazing. And it's still blowing faster than this tank and while its DPM might be a little less it's got way better gun handling. And so I think the only reason why I would recommend that you buy Laza's Sherman is if you're a tank collector or if you just absolutely love Dimitri Laza for some reason. And if that's the case then having sixth sense for free on him will be absolutely awesome. But as it stands the vehicle that was gifted to me on my press account did not have brothers in arms for free on the rest of the crew. And I think you'd be way better trying to pick up something like a Rudy or alternatively picking up a Thunderbolt. Gosh, even a T-3485M is a way better tier 6 Soviet premium medium tank than this vehicle. So I guess we should kind of tip our hats to Wargaming for not kind of embracing that idea of Soviet bias in World of Tanks and also releasing not one but two premium tanks in a row now that are kind of not overpowered. But I still feel that they kind of missed something that they could have done with the M4A2. The Thunderbolt was different enough and I feel like they could have made wow, just a few more changes to this vehicle without making it overpowered just give it a different kind of flavor of gameplay to a regular Sherman. But nevertheless, if you want to get your hands on this, it will be released on the 11th of January on the North American server and to be decided when it's going to be released on the European server. And so ladies and gentlemen, that's about it for today. I hope you enjoyed this video. It was just useful to you. If it was, please give it a thumbs up. But if you absolutely hated it, give it a thumbs down and let me know in the comments what you think about Laza's M4A2 Sherman. Is it something that you're going to be picking up or is it something you're going to be giving a miss? And as always, thank you so much for watching. You've been epic and hopefully I'll see you soon.